with the first question, um, looking at this movie, what are the main institutions and agents of change um, that this video suggests dri drive urban transformation? Yes, uh, I am Hassan I'm from Working Group 3. So we decided yesterday that uh, each of us answer one of these questions. So I am Perfect. responsible for question number one. Uh, yes, uh, in regard to this video, I think there were three main game players for this uh, urban transformation, which were the first group by uh, urban planner, consultant, and researcher. And the second group can be can say this the policy maker and these authorities. And the third group can be say this the big giant companies like uh, Google, Tesla, I don't know, Amazon, which are uh, which have a big responsibility to help the community to trans to, to, to transform this uh, to help us doing this uh, urban transformation. But about this urban planner, I think it's, uh, he was a bit optimistic, uh, just in case, for example, just uh, to use seven percent of the land to settle seven to four million of people. And then just, is it possible to, I mean, uh, to use just seven percent of the land to settle four million of people and then the rest of 92% of the land being untouched, is it possible without changing the quality of life? Just as an example, without changing just what happened to green area per capita, for example, for the city like Melbourne. And then for in, in terms of Malmo in Sweden, the video said that they are going to be 100% renewable energy by 2030, but I know that there are still a lot of discussion and debate in Sweden that either like they are going to go toward renewable energy or they are still want to uh, stick to this uh, nuclear power plant, you know, to build new power plant. They, they, there is a push by this industry, but in Sweden that they, they say that we still need, uh, if you want we as an industry section in Sweden work well, like before, we need still stable and cheap electricity. And if, if if we are going to, if we are going to still grow and have economic growth, so we need to stick to this uh, or current plan, which is a nuclear power plant and so on. And for this uh, other game players, giant companies, I think uh, these big companies like, uh, as I told, like Google, Amazon, Tesla, they will have a big role. Like uh, what's currently it's going on about 5G technology. The, the, Chinese company Huawei, they were supposed to establish this 5G technology in UK, but then a lot of debate and discussion happened that, okay, the, the, are you sure about this? Are you sure that we are going to give all of this data to a company like Huawei? Or should we give this uh, privilege to another company in US or UK? For, for self-driving cars, there's big kind of competition between this company like Google or Tesla to which company can uh, make the first uh, actual safe driving car that can work in reality in the city because they are still working, they are still in the job for self-driving cars is, is still in progress and there's no, they are all just in testing period, you know. And I think, yeah, that's the question for the, answer for the first question yeah. absolutely thanks Hassan that was that was excellent um, yeah maybe f first of all let you know others chip in or ref uh, respond to, to um, the answer of Hassan yeah I say something add something to that yep I uh, thank you Hassan for that uh, I would uh, add one key agent this and uh, there's a lot of response to the transition literature saying that this agent is often ignored especially when it comes to urban transitions and you can call that the user so it, at the beginning of this video we saw that uh, you know the politician was talking about you know how to convince people to move back into the city center 
regardless of whatever technology you're talking about, whether it's a new phone, a cleaner car, a smart meter for your house, or a new practice, uh, you know, a new way of living, a lot of the time, this is not, not the case with, let's say, a nuclear power plant, but anything having to do with an end-use consumer, you have to convince the consumer to get on board. And if you cannot do that, well, then your technology will not be taken into use and it will be sort of the classic distinction between the invention and the innovation. And so the urban resident is a key agent, or rather, not the urban resident, people, people that live places, which is all of us. Yeah. You have to convince them that living in cities, in mid-rise, high-rise, whatever type of uh, you know, urban form you want, that that's a good idea. It seems yeah. to be happening all over the world. Thanks. That, that, that was an excellent um, addition. And um, I sort of what I was... Yeah, just, we, sorry, we have to sort of go to the next question, but just sort of a quick reflection here. Um, because what I think the video really also shows is that, you know, the linear model of innovation <laughs> is not dead. It is very alive and it's very kicking, um, even though it kind of comes in different guises. But yeah, this was a, a classic sort of example of how sort of the technologies and also sort of, you know, like nature-based solutions, which are not necessarily technologies, how the innovations are supposed to sort of just become absorbed um, and, and, you know, become the, the solutions of, of our problem uh, problems. And yeah, there's, you know, you could say, you could even stretch it further and say, where's the user in all this, but also where's the citizen in all this? You know, wh where's, Where's the the legitimacy for for these technologies? Where's the sort of you know, the, the democratic foundation um, that we want these smart cities and so on and sort of you know these quite uh, intrusive um, technologies on on our privacy? And um, I think this video um, really sort of is a, a case in point about how uh, often these uh, messy contested aspects get kind of brushed over um, in, in sort of hopeful accounts of, uh, of sustainable futures. Okay, um, but maybe it starts to go a little bit already in question two. Um, so to what extent can this video be considered to be empowering or disempowering urban sustainability transitions? Yeah, hi, my name is Anna Rika and I'm from Working Group uh, 2. Um, so we talked about this question in regard to, or we could see the different uh, adaptions in the video. They talked about density, smart technologies, sharing, decentralization, effectivization, and, and nature-based solutions. And I think it became clear that, that this video is a six, six year old. Um, there is nowadays a bit more criticism towards some of these aspects that they introduced. and. We talked more in depth about density and sharing. And about density, we, we talked about um, the aspect of empower, empowering and disempowering in relation to, to space, in geographical space, uh, cities, urban areas and regions. And um, they talked about the idea of connecting uh, cities and, and areas into larger areas and, and regions. And we talked about that this could be uh, empowering for the smaller regions around bigger cities. For example, Malmö uh, can benefit from being close to, to Copenhagen. And, and then if we have the idea of greater Copenhagen, for example. Uh, then we talked about, they showed the area of Western Harbor in Malmö. So we talked about these kind of flagship uh, districts that are being uh, developed into, for example, smart uh, or with smart technology. And, and here we talked about the winners and losers aspect of um, who can afford to live in these areas and what happens to the other areas in the city that don't get as much attention or are not seen as attractive. Uh, and, and then we talked about the neoliberal system that, that uh, kind of causes this, uh, these inequalities uh, in the in within cities and and the spaces and and in between people as well. Um, 
Then we talked about what is a livable city and in the video they take uh, also up the point about um, Melbourne becoming 24 hour city. So there is the time aspect as well. Uh, and and they also mentioned how the number of people really is a key and that connects to Lars's uh, lecture about the, how that aspect might be a bit more, a bit too technical uh, to quantitative measures. Um, and then lastly, we talked about sharing and in this video, they talked very positively about, um, for example, Airbnb and, and they were maybe even a bit naive with, with the, uh, possibilities uh, around Airbnb and now uh, six years later we can see that that there has been uh, some negative aspects uh, connected with that as well regarding affordability and and um, tourists or yeah cities attracting more tourists so uh, instead or uh, instead of serving the locals uh, more uh, and Lastly, we also talk, touched upon the idea of urban villages and, and sharing and how we kind of saw that these ideas are kind of going back in time. Like these ideas are nothing new, uh, but now they are taking place in the neoliberal environment. Mm. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Anarika. That was really, really excellent as well. Um, any responses? Can I add something, Lars? Yeah, of course about you know the, the energy transition and uh, you, know, you need to be a bit closer to the mic oh sorry yeah um it's about the um, the coal usage down in uh, in australia and how they kind of picture they, they say that incremental change in how they utilize the coal and they kind of uh, the efficiency is good enough so that would be like an incremental change so that's like they're still in the same regime or the niche and then th there's no change basically into a renewable so they kind of say that they they empower or they is disempowering because they say it's good enough to just make a it's like you know in norway with the oil here and they just uh, you know make it greener in a sense the way that they extract the oil i mean it doesn't matter right we need a change a regime change so that's kind of disempowering that people think that's okay just to to, to incrementally change yeah, yeah cool cool um Thanks. I'll just quickly reflect here again. Um, so, really loved your answer, uh, Anarika. And yes, it's a bit of a dated movie, but at the same time, um, you know, not you know the whole gamut of critical reflections you laid out are definitely not become mainstream yet um in sort of the popular sort of discourse of future melbourne and also in the imaginations of of decision makers and policy makers um so there's still a lot of sort of hope and belief in sort of you know smartness and smart city solutions um without a lot of reflection unfortunately um I think, I mean, one of the big game changers is obviously COVID-19 and um, how that is going to, you know, that, that's, you know, that, ironically, uh, that's like the biggest shock that Melbourne has experienced um, in the past decades, as in many places in the world. Um, and at the time where we get hit by a real shock, um, also the Resilient Melbourne initiative is being dismantled. <laughs> because we get defunded out of a sort of preemptive austerity. So um, we won't be going into detail about that, but um, it sort of alludes to also sort of the neoliberal system, um, how, you know, this is also very much sort of, um, done in sort of a new public management kind of, uh, kind of way. Um, and, but I, what I really, what I think the video showed a lot was sort of, um, and explicitly said some at, at times, sort of the notion of path dependency, um, both um, material sort of path dependency, building um, further on existing infrastructure, the tram line example. And again, that sort of refers also to your point, Emil, about, so, you know, you have this sort of massive fossil uh, energy infrastructure and um, they, it's, it's very hard without a proper shake-up that 
um, you know, these sort of systems get dislodged. So um, it'll be interesting to sort of follow the effects of COVID-19 also on, you know, whether they in, in sort of transition sort of think, whether they, you know, provide windows of opportunity for niche initiatives to really sort of uh, shift, shift tracks. Um, and unfortunately, for example, for public transport, things don't look very good in Melbourne because, you know, that the public sector, the public transport sector got a major hit as a result of social distancing, obviously. Okay, um, I see we're running a bit out of time again, but would you mind if we go to the fourth question? Because I think the third one we can just, it is of course a bit of a straw man's argument. Um, yeah, um, so there's a lot that you can sort of critique, right? Um, and, and we're quite good at that, social scientists unpacking, um, you know, who, the, the, you know, the voices that are not being heard here, the, the democratic deficit, the, the unfairness uh, of, you know, the way that um, future, urban futures are, are imagined here and advocated. But, um, you know, coming from our research, um, how, you know, this is sort of the, the discourse that, you, that you're up against, right? There's a lot of sort of belief and hope with, with policy makers and decision makers that you know, they can fix the sustainability problem, um, be it through densification, be it through sharing, be it whatever. So how do you actually sort of, you know, how do you create impact? How do you translate uh, sustainable transition and transformation research um, into urban policy and practice? I'm very curious to hear what group has to say about that. Yeah, hi. Um... Uh, I'm Silver, I'm also from Working Group 3. Um, yeah, we discussed that question um, um, with, with, in relation to, to a paper by, 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 by Howard and, and others from the University of Bergen that we had to read for the course. And they talked about three main roles that uh, academics can have uh, with relation to practice. So they can be either producers of, of actionable knowledge so, so producing knowledge that can be directly applied, or they can be either critical bystanders, so asking the difficult questions, or they can be these sort of connectors, or, or, or um, so gathering people together, uh, mediating relations, and 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 facilitating these transition processes. And I think well, a lot of the times the third role is the most important. So, so you need someone to act as to act as a translator or a mediator or a facilitator to, 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 to create this common language and to translate between groups. And this can be either um, an academic or this can be someone more, more neutral, like a design agency or like a um, consultancy. But, but, but I think this, this, this role of the translator is, is really um, crucial a lot of the times. Um, but I'd like to hear about your experience, Lars. So what, what, what do you think your role was? And, in, in, in Melbourne. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I, I, by the way, I, I know the paper well. I, I very much like it. And I'd like to in, introduce it actually in, in our course uh, on the next occasion. Um, and I would probably say, yeah, I, 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 I should have read that paper before I went to Melbourne because uh, it would have provided me with a sort of a framing of, you know, what role I as sort of a, a, a chair in between a sort of local government and a university could sort of could fulfill. Um, it, it evolved into that sort of third role of being a facilitator. Um, I called it a boundary spanner. Um, and I think that... You know, I, I, that, that, was, that was hard work. That was quite frustrating also, especially if you are not familiar with, um, you know, if you're a newcomer to, to a country and to its cultures and everything. And, you know, you need, to, you need to have a lot of tacit contextual knowledge of a place. But you also get exposed to, uh, to nasty politics. And my picture and name featured a few times in um, the populist local press. Uh, saying that, you know, the city of Melbourne is sort of putting money into research is just a waste of taxpayers' money. 
and quite aggressively sort of, you know, putting my salary in the newspaper and things like that. So it's, it's not always sort of great fun. Um, but having said that, it is, it is at the same time sort of rewarding if you see that, um, you know, as an academic, you actually um, can make a change and get practitioners, decision makers to perhaps think differently. And I'm, I'm personally kind of happy that um, the city of Melbourne really sort of now has endorsed the notion of innovation, uh, not sort of as sort of a high tech fix solution, but that they really sort of think that, yeah, we have to make sure that when we innovate that we allow for failure, right? And bringing together, for example, people within the city, um, smart city office with the people who are working in the, spare, in the space of climate change. So I, I was doing a lot of that, but at the same time, sort of a critical reflection on that, this is not the way that the, you know, the university system is set up. So I had, a, I had to sort of, uh, at the same time, take a bit of a hit in terms of you know, scientific publications and productivity, because I was doing a lot of sort of um, non-academic service um, and having all the time a bad conscience that I was not spending enough time doing research. So, and, and also that sort of, you know, the way that our incentive structure is set up at university, we are supposed to, you know, publish and, you know, it goes into metrics and um, we are supposed to bring in money uh, for funding, etc., for, for research funding. And, you know, that third role where you become that facilitator does not sit easy with sort of the, the regime, if you like, um, in the way that academic work uh, is, is organized. So, it, yeah, um, it's, but I mean, I, I absolutely, I recommend it wholeheartedly because I increasingly realize now that I've, I can take some distance from it, that, you know, it has been an incredibly uh, rewarding in terms of also getting empirical insights, right? Um, but I didn't really have the time then to 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 really sort of uh, put it put it into writing and put it into papers. Uh, somebody already shared a paper. Very good. Oh yeah, uh, that's a good one, Ira. Um, back to you, Silver. Uh, just quickly. So yes, you could sort of identify different roles, but what would be the sort of the instruments and the, you know, somebody really sort of pushes you and says, but, you know, what concretely should su such an academic, for example, do? What? Well, I think it, it, it has a lot to do with uh, co-creation and, and you, you can use, uh, I mean, if you want to take on the role of translator or mediator or facilitator, you have to use these co-creation or or, or co-design methods and tools. So they, you can just go, just go and tell people what to do. Or, mm. or uh, and I, I found a lot of these design tools useful. Uh, and there are a lot of them around. So, um, but 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 again, these are not things that you know academics would usually use. I guess so. So. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think in, in, in sort of more eclectic, flexible disciplines, um, and especially I think within say transition management, for example, co-creation uh, workshops and action research uh, has become sort of, if you like, even sort of the preferred methodology of choice. Uh, exactly because, you know, the, they see the limitations of uh, how you otherwise could create impact. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I think we're kind of get, getting increasingly familiar um, with it. But uh, to, to my one of the points in my slide also is that you need to be careful that, you know, don't end up with sort of workshop fatigue and... Uh, you know, you create also expectations by doing co-creation workshops. And if you run co-creation workshops for years in a row, you know, you, you, they will backfire you because people feel will be like, hey, but, you know, we've had now five workshops. When, when do we sort of see some effects? When is something is going to happen here? And, and there it is sort of, you know, the, again, the sort of politics come into play as well. That's, 
you know, um, and it's really important not just sort of to look at the process of co-creation, but who's who's involved and you know that there it's a it's a it's a balance about you know re, repre, representation but also making sure that you have change agents uh, involved that have power and resources to achieve things to make a change because if it is just sort of to you know if it's co-creation just happening in a bubble of people you know having great ideas but not the means to you know um effectuate those ideas um then that's also a bit of a, a sad uh fate Sid, thanks again for being our uh, timekeeping conscience uh let's take a five maybe even ten minute break uh and then go into session three